reimagining the 2021 concert season, creating digital concerts, and of course your questions on Maestro Mailbag on this episode of Behind the Baton with Maestro Troy Quinn. Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Baton with Maestro Troy Quinn. I'm excited to have you here. Troy, how are you today? I'm doing great, Tim. Good to see you. I'm back in sunny L.A. <laughs> back. It's like you never left, right? right. Well, we always see you here. But you were here for a little while. We're going to talk about that soon. Um, well, I guess the elephant in the room is since the last time we've talked to each other, Things have changed. Can you give us a little update on, uh, on, the, on the season? Absolutely. So we've, like most arts organizations, Tim, have um, pivoted to a virtual concert series, which is very exciting. And also, I think, expands our footprint in the area in Venice and in Sarasota County. We have, um, I just got back, as we'll talk about, from Venice uh, um, doing a recording. So we're going to have four digital virtual recordings that are gonna go to our subscribers first with the link, um, and then we'll be open to the public. So we're still keeping it very active and um, you know we're still involving the musicians and, and still creating music. So it's very exciting. We basically turned ourselves into a studio, <laughs> uh, both audio and video. So uh, that's what we've been very busy doing. We'll be having a, a Strings Unhinged concert that is going to be released when our normally opening night concert would happen in November. We're doing a holiday concert as well as two other ones, a chamber concert and a brass and percussion concert in the spring. So we've got that on the docket to tide everybody over. And then of course, we still got our Linda Etter for May 1st and 2nd performing with the Venice Symphony and our Patriotic Pops on Memorial Day weekend at Cool Today Park. So we're still staying busy as soon as we can pivot and do things at the VPAC uh, with a safe crowd, we will be doing that. So before we move on and talk about what's coming up, so the things we had planned, you know, this this 2021 20, season that was in the books, uh, what's going to happen with, with those concerts? Well, it's all great because we've got all our guest artists booked and those concerts will literally move over intact for the 21-22 concert season. So Tom Hooten will be here next November, just as he was supposed to be here this November. Uh, Eric Riggler, who will be our highlight for our Oscar concert will be here. So those programs are exactly as they were. They're just going to be uh, postponed until 21-22. So we've got our season planned until 2022, and that's a nice advantage. The programs will remain intact. Our guest artists are on board and signed. So uh, now we're just pivoting on trying to bring our community a little different variety of things in the meantime. That's awesome. It's kind of nice to know. It's like, okay, that next season's already taken care of, and now we're going to kind of come back and, and, and reimagine this season here. Right. We usually do our Maestro Mailbag segment later on, but one of the questions that Larry from Venice posed was, you know, do we do something? It's hard to imagine ourselves being, you know, in the VPAC having these concerts. You know, can we take our subscription and move it to a Zoom concert? But the good news is um, there's no fee for these concerts. Is that correct? That's right, Tim. And I think that's been um, our impetus to try to get the music to everybody. And this is sort of our gift for the community. I mean, we, we rely on our donors and our audience members to support this live music, and we want that to continue. Um, and so there's actually going to be no fee for these virtual concerts. And everything, uh, folks who have paid for their tickets this past season, subscribers, can roll that over. They can donate their tickets back, of course, um, and they can still save their seats. Of course, that's the big, <laughs> the big bonus. You'll still get your aisle seat or your balcony seat. And so uh, there is going to be no um, financial um, payment for this type of concert. There'll just be a link to unlock it. And so eventually, you know, that'll be open to the public. 
And the wonderful thing is, you're right, we, the seats are important, but instead of worrying about on the aisle seat or I sit in the balcony, you can enjoy these concerts anywhere. You can be on your lanai, you can be um, traveling around, you can be on your own couch, which I think is going to be really, really fun to invite more people in to learn more about the Venice Symphony. Absolutely, Tim. You know, and these types of concerts have a different flair to them. We're, we're able to uh, let loose a little bit because, of course, it's not 80 musicians on stage, which, of course... Uh, has its advantages and disadvantages. One of the things that viewers will see is we're all social distance, we all have masks, it's mostly strings and some brass and winds, and how the sound is affected. I don't think you'll be able to tell necessarily on the recording because, you know, we had such great, um, great production value to this recording session, but you'll get to hear string music you normally wouldn't hear. You get to hear some brass, a percussion ensemble, uh, that we have for the holiday. Really cool things that kind of expand our horizon and also our listeners. So we know that a lot of your work happens before you even arrive here in Venice. So when the decision was made and we had to do something um, virtual like we are, how did that process begin for you? Right, well Chris Kasten uh, had the idea and I to come up with a virtual concert series and so we put our heads together along with Dana Kimball, and uh, that certainly has been, I think, probably one of the most successful types of concert uh, offerings since COVID, and, and a lot of orchestras are doing that. Either they're doing that, or they're trying to get in the back in the hall with a very reduced audience. We thought that we wanted to, you know, maintain our product the same way, and so keep the musicians working as much as possible. So we basically planned these four concerts and we recorded three of them. As you know, two weeks ago, I snuck into Florida and I'm uh, healthy, <laughs> thankfully. And, uh, and, and we recorded that with the orchestra. So we've got our Strings Unhinged concert, we've got our Holiday Pops concert, and we did a, a chamber concert we're calling Resound and Resilience. And so I'll also be coming back in January to do the brass and percussion recording. So we'll have all four of those. And um, it's a little bit like, you know, of course, here in uh, my other home, I'm used to the studios and I'm used to recording. Um, but usually it's just audio. So we can do whatever we need to do. We don't have to do as many, t we can do as many takes as we want with the orchestra. With the video element, it's interesting. You kind of have to get it all right, at least one take, as you know, all the way through. So the pressure's on, but it's also, it, it allows the audience to really not just be, um, orally invested but but um, visually as well because you're up close right and personal with the musicians and with the soloists and so I think it's uh you know it's just like you're watching the concert in your PJ so um, I think I think that has a benefit to it I think of course there's nothing like live visceral music and we'll be back doing that as soon as we can in the meantime we've got this wonderful digital footprint and I think it's going to expand our our reach of who knows about the Venice Symphony, you know, and we've got our fine, fine players. They all did a wonderful job. These were long sessions, four hours, five hours, and and then um, Marcus, who's our concert master, also did the audio engineering, and I helped him with some of the um, mixing and mastering on that. Just so our team is fantastic, you know, to be able to pull that off and pivot very quickly, not easy. It's a very big undertaking and it's a lot easier to do a live concert in two hours and it's done. To capture all this, and that's the beauty of it. You know, Arthur Fiedler and the pop started this way too. He knew the power of television and when that came in, uh, it really brought the pops worldwide to, to, to audiences, not just over the country, but all over the world. And so I think that's the hope too, with all of, all of our arts organizations, especially the orchestras, that we can actually be able to share this with people in Alaska or Connecticut or not just Florida. Um, and that's the exciting part, you know, to really get to know the Venice Symphony, our fine musicians in our community. Exactly. We could take advantage of this opportunity and just expand that range and share music with, with others. Um, it was it really was a whirlwind week. It's funny that we're on Zoom right now because we talked that week of, hey, it'd be great to get together and have this conversation. I don't think we had more than four minutes when we were running around <laughs> right. and we literally laughed and said, we're going to have to wait till this is all over before we actually have a couple minutes to sit down and talk about this. Um, when you got in, um, tell us about kind of what that week was leading up to the actual recording session. 
Well, it was really focused on the recording, Tim, so not so much going on in terms of other extracurriculars that I would usually do or uh, business with the symphony. We were, we were really trying to focus on the setup. So, you know, Marcus went in there on Friday and uh, had the audio situation set up. We've got uh, uh, wonderful Captivation Media is, did the video production and they had their setup. So it was really about organizing all of those things. The music, even something like that. Uh, something simple. Al Lyman, our librarian, was wonderful coordinating all of that. And just the normal things that the audience doesn't see, or the patrons don't see behind the scenes, all of that is basically exacerbated because it all has to be perfect and right and, uh, you know, quality control. So it was really more preparation. It's like going into a marathon, you know, especially recording. I love recording and I do, of course, a lot of that in Los Angeles. But, um, Doing it with the video aspect and the audio aspect at the same time um, is challenging. You know, we also recorded a lot of our chamber ensembles, our string quartets, our brass quintet, our woodwind quintet, our flute and, flute and harp duo, as well as our percussion ensemble. So we had the whole gamut of folks. Um, now, no, no more than 15 people were in the, in the hall at the same time, so I think that's a, that's a good thing, of course, for safety considerations. But we were able to put together a program that's pretty varied. And uh, so it was all leading up to that. I mean, even down to the lighting, and it's really, you're more like a director now than just a music director on these types of creative outlets. And, and safety was huge. Um, Chris, we mentioned before, but along with the other um, Venice Symphony staff and Sharon and Candace and Allison were all there. We were checking temperatures. We were, you know, wiping down. We were disinfecting things. With all the protocol, obviously getting the group together was so important to do it safely. What were some of the barriers and things that you saw in, in this genre, you know, to, to, to make music in this COVID era? Well, and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, Tim. The, the biggest thing is the distance between the players. Now, normally you'd see the concertmaster and the assistant or associate concertmaster right next to each other, or the ch principal cellist and the assistant or the flute and the second flute. Everybody is in close proximity to hear. You take the visual cues, you take the, the, the sonorities that you hear, and our fine colleagues are adept at making that work, and that's how they play their music. Um, even for me, it's, a, it's a, an adjustment to be able to have to ha keep all of this together, not just rhythmically, but also to keep all of the players precise and clean with the added distance it's very difficult you know I remember doing a concert when I was younger in Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris and that organ to the stage or the altar has about a six to seven second delay so the further you get you get apart the further and the more difficult it is to all stay together I think that's the biggest thing but you know it also wasn't a bad thing because I think that forces everybody to be very confident in their playing and, and make a little bit more beautiful sound normally than just type of blend in. So, um, you know, I, I didn't find it as much of a challenge as I thought I would. Um, the real thing also is the stamina, you know, because we're doing some of these pieces that are pretty standard, like Leroy Anderson, like classics, like Fiddle Faddle and Hoedown by Copeland, but they're really quite demanding actually on the player you know and to have to do that over and over three four five six times that gets taxing you know um it's not like the concert where no matter what happens if it goes well or not you just keep going and so there's no there's no second chance in a way that's good uh because you know you you, you obviously can only put out one quality performance but um it's good for your chops actually to to be able to do this a couple of times. So, but there's a fatigue level, especially, you know, with all of us, uh, that, that you have to balance that with the nature of how close to perfection can we get the recording. So what you'll see here in all of these is, is the fact that it wasn't like we recorded this in a studio, it's perfect, it's near perfect, but it's, as, it's a live performance. It's as if you're watching it live. So you can hear a, you know, a, somebody breathe you can hear a uh, squeak you know in the floor whatever you know it's um it's as if you're in a live performance now there's no babies crying <laughs> or um or anything that's distracting but i think that's that's the emotion we tried to go after that it wasn't just a perfect studio recording 
And, and it turned out great. And you're right, the fatigue factor, not only physically when you're end of the, the long marathon recording sessions, but mentally just being locked in so long. But the musicians, you know, did wonderful. It was fun too, because we recorded multiple concerts at the same time. So it'd be times where the brass group would come on, play, and they're like, okay, quick. Now we got to get ready for the holiday gear. We'd all run and put on, you know, some festive garb. It was, it was fun watching it behind the scenes all come together. But after that was even more work, right? They always call it post-production, right? So tell me a little bit about the post-production that you did with Marcus. Well, and we're still sort of in it. Marcus has done the, a fantastic job and did the majority of it. But of course, on, on some of these things, we had to get the right take. So we did two or three or four times. And so it's up to us to decide what actually sounded the best and what we could use balance-wise. And then, you know, the video production aspect of it is taking place as we speak now. So there's two aspects and it's a long process. We took hours and hours of footage, of course. And to line that up and sync it up perfectly with the audio is, is what really the trick is, you know. Um, so Marcus and I, I think, did a, did a great job on getting the um, final audio precise. And I'm not an engineer, you know, I'm not the expert. I just know what, uh, what I hear and what sounds good. And then I can give that to the expert to make the technical choices like um, Marcus and, and Wes Boland from Captivation Media. Those guys uh, can sort of enact the vision. And, um, you know, so far so good. I was pleased. I think, you know, the Venice Symphony's never sounded better, certainly. And uh, I think everybody's going to be uh, very excited to see what we've been up to. I mean, this is going to be awesome. You're going to be right in there with the musicians. And I, I think whether you're uh, at your couch or wherever you're watching the show, you are going to feel like you're on stage with the members of the symphony. Absolutely, Tim. And, you know, the other thing it's brought back is the interest in chamber music and some of this great repertoire um, that's not heard all the time or not heard in the masses. You know, we did a piece from Elgar's Serenade for Strings, a classical piece. Gorgeous, gorgeous uh, beautiful string melodies and some of the quartets are playing Mozart and and Grieg and some other things but also the fun stuff West Side Story Copeland's Ho Hoedown and things that you don't hear so much in a chamber setting there's some great repertoire you know especially for um, especially for strings and so we've dedicated one concert totally to strings uh, the others are holiday we've got a concert for brass that's upcoming as well as that chamber ensemble group, which just everything on there from Vivaldi's mandolin concerto to, um, to um, Mozart quartets. So it's gonna be fantastic. And it just gives you another taste to just see the amazing musicians that are involved with the Venice Symphony. And when they're in those smaller ensembles, they, they really, really shine. Absolutely. So if you want to be one of the first to know about this November release concert, simply on the top of our website, there's a form where you can sign up to, to be in the loop and we'll have digital tickets. Of course, they're free. So share with your family and friend across the globe and let them know about the Venice Symphony. And hopefully they'll see this amazing product that we have right here on the Gulf Coast. But now, you know, we got to keep the tradition here. We love having our Maestro mailbag. It's a chance for you to ask Maestro Quinn some questions, whether you're bumping into him in the lobby, but now we're on Zoom across the country. We can still have those questions. So uh, I have a question from David, and David lives in Naperville, Illinois, but also comes down here from Venice. And he wonders if you ever thought about having a signature piece for the Venice Symphony, something that's performed maybe at every concert or once a year that's like a signature piece for this group. Absolutely, Tim. David read my mind because that's something actually we've even tried to implement a little bit. Last year, our sort of encore piece was Farandole by Bizet, as you will remember. We played that, you know, uh, several times. So, yeah, I absolutely have a few of those in mind, and, uh, and I'd like to almost even change those from season to season that this would be our signature piece for the season and perhaps something to do with uh, Florida and our, and our um, Gulf Coast. So that's certainly on my mind to have a uh, signature piece. Very good. Now, you mentioned earlier traveling around, and I know that you spend half your life, it feels like, probably in uh, airports. Um, Skip had a question about just, do, do you enjoy traveling? Is that something that 
is one of the things you look forward to. Do you get a chance to travel for leisure as well? Absolutely. I do. I love it, Tim, still. Even I've been doing this for over a decade, and I never get tired of the travel, funny enough. I mean, check back with me in another 10 years. But um, I, I really enjoy traveling. It's been my life's work. I was always obsessed with planes as a kid and wanting to take off to foreign places. And certainly I've done a lot of traveling in Europe, the South Pacific, and most of it was music related. Um, concerts and touring performances. So I love it. It's actually one of my favorite things about the job. Now, do you have a place, a little secret, like Troy Quinn trick? Like, is there, where was that place that you were kind of wowed by? Maybe you weren't expecting much, and then you went there, and it was just like, wow, this is a place we definitely got to come back. You know, a place that's dear to my heart, of course, that some of the listeners won't be surprised, is Rhode Island, where I went to school and, and grew up. And, uh, you know, there's, su there's such a gem uh, uh, of these geographic places there, Newport, Block Island, and it's close between Boston and New York. It's sort of my escape, and, you know, my family's from Connecticut. Um, that's where I go to sort of recharge, you know, Tim. Um, as far as some of the most beautiful places I've been to, I could probably name the top three, and they all mostly were music-related. New Zealand, gorgeous country. I toured there a few years back. Alaska, I was the music director there for three years, one of the most beautiful places. And of course, Fiji, because why not? <laughs> why not? Right? And I'll add that to the list. I'll tell you, when I came to um, Venice the first time and to Sarasota, and they said Siesta Key, number one beach in the United States, I was skeptical coming from LA and Malibu. But it is, it's my favorite place, and I love it there. And um, what a gem we have. Well, for one more question, we're going to go get back to, uh, to music related. And this is from Hannah here in Venice. And she wonders about conductors and using batons. Um, I know that you are actually teaching a conducting class at USC. And uh, what do you tell your students? What's your thoughts on using that baton? And why do you use it? And uh, tell me what that tool is all about. Well, I've done both. I think it's really the preference of the conductor and what ensemble you're conducting, Tim. I started actually as a choral conductor, so I started with just my hands, no baton. I now pretty much only use baton unless it's something more intimate and smaller. I mean, you know, just historically, the 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 use of the baton grew out of the fact that the orchestra expanded in the late classical and romantic era. So when Mendelssohn started uh, conducting and Mahler, the, the, as orchestras grew, they had to get some attention. And so this sort of stick was born. Um, and uh, I think it has a lot to do with the ensemble. There are famous conductors that don't. Keith Lockhart doesn't use a baton, neither does Gergiev. If he does, sometimes he uses a toothpick, if you can believe it. Um, it almost doesn't matter as long as you can get the music across. To me, I think it's a logistic thing and a visual cue. Um, you know, if you're in a huge hall with a big delay and you've got 100 players and you're doing Mahler, you should probably use the baton. But again, there are conductors that, that don't prefer to do that. And uh, I think it's a preference thing, really. You know, for me, I prefer to do that. I certainly teach my students to use the baton and the baton grip. And, uh, and that's, that's an art in and of itself. But, um, you know, I don't, I, th I don't think it matters because, you know, as we say, the, the baton is the extension of the arm. So whatever you do with the arm in your hand, you have to do with the baton. So it's all one thing. Thank you for your time. If you have a question that you'd like to submit to uh, Maestro Troy Quinn, check it out at tinyurl.com backslash maestro mailbag, and we can share your questions right here on a future episode. Troy, again, your time's important. It was fun when we were running around in person. It's like, you know, it, it only took you to go back to the other side of the country for us to have a moment to sit down and talk about the events of that recording weekend. And we got more events and more special announcements coming up about the season. But um, thanks for keeping the music going for us. Our pleasure, Tim. So great to see you and work with you again. And uh, look forward to seeing you in person soon. Sounds great. Take care, Troy. Thanks again.